have a joke about the dot. I don't have a joke about the uh, hot dog either. So I would just jump to the topic right away. Um, so my name is Lei. Um, I lead the uh, Department of Technology Infrastructure in Bloomberg. So we're basically a group of technologists focused on global infrastructure. Think data centers, connectivities, um, developer productivities, uh, think uh, SDS tooling, and also uh, reliability solutions, think telemetry and instant responses, right? So um, depends on the audience. Sometimes uh, you know, you're familiar with what Bloomer is, sometimes you don't. So I thought it might be a good idea to talk a little bit about, about our company. Um, so there's no better way to talk about our company by sharing some numbers. I want to highlight a few numbers. We have more than 9,000 engineers, and most of them are software engineers. Uh, we handle a lot of market techs, uh, which in the billions and 600 billions, I believe. And um, we also have tons of uh, folks uh, focused on AI research and engineering. So we have uh, more than, you know, really today's 500 plus in employees focused on AI products uh, for um, sort of our customers. So the takeaway here is we are, I guess, you know, building a lot of software and use a lot of data to empower our flagship product, which is called the Bloomberg Terminal and to really support our users to make the most important decisions for them to do their job uh, the best. Um, in the technical lens, um, a lot of time kind of to explain that we actually have one of the largest private network uh, in the whole world. We also have one of the largest JavaScript code base um, in the world. Um, we, because the domain we're in, uh, so from a terminal is really, you can think of a um, software that supports thousands of different applications. Uh, we call them functions, right? Um, email is a function. Uh, news is a group of functions. Uh, let's say fixed income, price to yield calculation, to spread calculation is another function. Um, trading workflows is another group of functions. So there's many, many, many different types of functions. As you can imagine, we kind of have to utilize different technologies to really support those uh, functionalities. Uh, we also been increasingly more than used, but also contribute to open source communities. Um, for this audience, I guess I want to call out, you know, we kind of helped creation of the KSERV, uh, Envoy AI gateways, and among many, many other things that, that we deploy in-house and support the communities. Again, in summary, there's a lot of software, there's a lot of data. Uh, we kind of have to um, figure out how to make the best of AI tooling to support us to do our engineering work. All right, so get to what is AI for coding. Um, we started about two years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, um, and as I guess the rest of the world, we look at the toolings provided, and you know, I apologize if, you're, if your logos are not here, um, but I, as you can imagine, it's kind of like overwhelming, right? There's so many things, and every day there's news about this is great, this is great. Um, so at the time, we actually didn't know what all the AI solutions can help us to uh, boost our productivities as well as stability. But one thing we knew at the time is um, unless we deploy and try, we wouldn't know what's the best way to benefit from all the awesome work and, and you know, a lot of folks are contributing to. So at the time, uh, we quickly formed a team of people, start kind of like release um, kind of a, a set of capabilities so that people start iterating on um, utilizing the toolings. And then, of course, you know, we are a data company, so kind of want to get a sense of how we measure the impact and um, what we can do from the capability we provide, right? So we look at the typical developer productivity measurements. We ran a few survey. Uh, it was very obvious that people felt like there's much quicker uh, proof concept. People roll out tests. Um, there's a lot of one-time use scripts being generated. And then the measurements dropped actually pretty quickly when you go beyond all the greenfield type of thing, right? And then, then we start thinking like, okay, so what are the things that we should really be doing 
using all those wonderful things so that we can really make a dent um, in, the, in, in the space. And then at the time, we also kind of like also be thoughtful of um, unleash a very powerful tooling, right? Uh, the, the benefits is it's very fast. The challenge is also it's very fast, right? Uh, for any of you who actually dealt with hundreds of millions of lines of code, you probably understand the system complexity is a at least um, exponential or at least polynomial, I guess, function of your live code on software assets, right? So at some point, you kind of want to be very careful uh, what you do with your software assets. And what we thought, so maybe we should look at some of the basics. One idea we had is, um, all right, so AI for coding, there's a narrow definition of what coding is, but there's also a broader definition of what software engineering, right? And then maybe we can also look into some of the work our developers don't really prefer to do. For instance, um, some maintenance work, some of the migration work, some of the know, maintenance work and stuff like that. So I want to give some examples of the things that we've been trying and we think there's pretty good return investment. So the question we ask ourselves is how do we evolve our code base, right? All right the first one is, all right, wouldn't it be cool uh, the day you get a ticket saying, hey, you know, this piece of software needs to be patched, and at the same time you have a pull request with the fix, with the patch, and also with the thinking of why the patch happened that way. Right? So it's kind of like we're trying to uh, broadly deploy something called uplift agents, um, broadly scan through our code base and figure out what the patch would be applicable and be able to apply those patch. Step back a little bit, we did have a regex based refactoring tool. Um, it works to some extent, but it's limited. Right now with um, LMs and the other tooling, so we are able to uh, see very much better results from the um, uplift agents. So there are a few challenges in case you also plan to deploy such capabilities. The first one is, I guess any AI or ML, it would be really nice if there's some deterministic verification capability. Uh, oftentimes it's not so easy, especially if you have test cases, if you don't have good linter, if you don't have good verification, the, the, the patch can sometimes be uh, uh, difficult to, to, to be applied. And uh, one thing we also realized when we deploy AI tooling is the average open pull requests increased and time to merge also increased uh, because you spin a lot of new code and then still we have to review the code and merge the code, right? So time to merge become a challenge sometimes. And the last one is, um, I think it applies to any gene I think is the shift becomes what do we want to achieve rather than how we want to achieve, right? So the second example that I, I want to share is uh, the other area that people kind of like sometimes in, really impact our productivity in a negative way or impact our stability in a negative way is how we handle instance. So we're trying to develop and then deploy um, instance response agents. Um, now, the importance of this is, if you really think about GNI tools, it's really, really fast, and it's also unbiased, right? In my instance, it can go through your code base really quickly, it can go through your telemetry system very quickly, it can go through your feature flags very quickly, it can go through your, um, I don't know, call trace very quickly, and in an unbiased lens. When we do troubleshooting, sometimes we have this biased view, so, okay, it must be this, it turns out to be not the case. So there's many, many interesting benefits um, by uh, deploying agents from this perspective. And then the second question is, become interesting is, imagine you have an organization of 10,000 people, um, let's say 9,000 people as I described. A lot of people are trying to fix those problems, right? And you can have 10 teams who wants to build a pull request review box. You have 20 teams who wants to build an instant response agents, right? They become very quickly chaotic and sometimes can have duplications. So before I talk about the paper pass, I'm going to give an example of the uh, instance response agent. So basically this is what, you know, a instance response agent will look like. 
um, the key part is we're going to need to build a lot of MCP servers to connect to the, uh, the metrics and logs dashboards you have, connect to the topology you have, whether it's network topology or it's the, um, your service dependency topology, uh, your alarms, your triggers, right, your SLOs. And then we kind of don't want people just start building MCP servers uh, without a paid pass. So we created a paid pass in partnership with our AI organization, and I will talk a little bit what that means. Before that, um, I do want to explain a little bit some of the platform principles. Some company allow teams to be, have a lot of freedom as, at, at the same time responsibility. In a sense, a busy unit can build whatever, infrastructure, whatever platform. Um, some organization have a very, very strong, tight abstraction of the service infrastructure and typically kind of have to use their platforms, right? So Bloomberg is kind of in the middle. If you look at the golden ones, we kind of believe in provide a golden path um, with enablement teams. So my team is really a enabling team. And one of the guiding principles for us is we want to make easy things extremely easy to do. Uh, sorry, the right things are extremely easy to do, and we want to make sure the wrong things are ridiculous hard to do. Right, so that's the guiding principle here. Now, move on. So what is the pay path here? So the pay path is uh, we have a gateway so that teams can easily figure out which model works the best. They can do quick experiments. They can, um, we can have visibility of what kind of model is being used, and we can also guide through teams which model should, is a better fit for, this, for the problem they want to solve. Uh, we have a tool discovery, uh, basically MCP directory via hub, so that in, let's say team A wants to do something, they will go to the hub, be, okay, someone's building an MCP server already, maybe I should partner with them to build it together, right? Uh, tool creation and deployment is via a pass. Uh, it's basically a, um, you know, a, a standard platform service where you can do your SDOC and, and we provide runtime environment for you as well taking care of all the auth and side of things as well. So it really reduces the friction of, for, for teams to, to deploy um, their MC, MCP servers. And then, the, this is kind of interesting, is we want to make demo very easy so that, or I should really say proof concept very easy so that people can try, have ideal generation, because uh, we believe in creativity come from some freedom of try different new things. But we also want to make sure the production requires some quality control. Um, because at the end of the day, stability and system reliability is, is at the core of our business. This is sort of the pay path that we deployed um, and enabled the rest of engineering, really the 9,000 software engineers, to do their job. Okay. And um, with all this, and then we start maybe, okay, Yes, we got a uh, pay path. We have some good ideas of how to evolve our code base. How about our people, right? Um, now, this is where I find that any new things, any adoption of new things provide opportunity to leverage the strengths you have and also identify the, some of the weaknesses that you may have. So, um, in Bloomberg, we have a well-established training program uh, it's more than 20 years. So there's onboarding training, depends on entry level, or depends on senior level. Um, so we have this whole training program to prepare folks to, uh, before they join the team. And what we did is we just incorporate AI coding in onboarding training program. And also show them how to best utilize them with our principles and our technologies, right? There's a huge benefit here because um, if any of you run into the challenge of adoption somehow run into a chasm, right? The rest of org is not uh, adopt as quick as possible. Whenever we have folks join a company, they learn how to do things in their way that when they go back to their team, they were like, hey, why don't we do that? Right, they're gonna challenge the, the, some of the senior folks as well to say, hey, there's a new way to do this type of thing, so why don't we do that? So we actually find this program extremely effective uh, to be a change agent for anything we wanna push out. And then a bunch of results, there's a lot more familiarity and comfort with the tooling. Um, and also the, the important part is there's a lot more nuanced insights of where it's at value. Right? The second one is um, oftentimes we run organization to push uh, new initiatives. 
So within Bloomer, we have something called um, a CHAM program and a guild program. That's basically across organizational tech communities where people have similar interests and similar passion. They get together and get stuff done. So um, we had this for more than 10 years now. Uh, we sort of bootstrapped engineering AI productivity community two years back, leveraged the, the community we have already, and then have some few results. Uh, because we have this, pretty much everyone passionate about this and will be in that community, so organically, it deduplicates efforts and there's shared learning, uh, shared learning happening. And it also helps to boost inner source contributions and the visit engineer idea, right? Oftentimes, team A wants to do something, team B, let's say a platform team, have different prioritization. And the way we solve this is via inner source or via visit engineer, which is move someone over the team, work for six months, a year, get it done, and then we can move on. Um, the last one is interesting. So our data shows individual contributors have a much better, stronger adoption than our leadership team. Now, if you think about this, a lot of software TLs and managers, in the age of AI, they kind of don't really have um, enough experience to truly guide their teams to build software, right? So oftentimes the stuff that they learned before might not be exactly applicable, but still very valuable, but there's some missing piece there to make sure they can continue to guide the team to do the right thing. So we're rolling out leadership workshops to make sure our leaders are equipped with whatever knowledge they need to have to drive the technology um, innovation. So um, I'm going to close my part and to share with you what, uh, the, the part I'm, I feel most excited about. The part I feel most, exci most excited about is that with a lot of um, creativity and innovation in the GNI space, actually changes the cost function of software engineering. Meaning, the trade-off decision of whether we do something versus we don't do something actually changes because some of the work become a lot cheaper to do and some work become a lot more ex expensive to do. I tend to think it is a great opportunity for engineers and engineering leaders to get back to some of the uh, basic principles and sort of ask a soul searching question, what is a high quality of engineering and how can we use a tool for that purpose? So that's it, thank you very much. <laughs>